Good evening, I'm Nathan W. Bingham and welcome to Ask Ligonier. Over the next hour, you're going to have the opportunity to ask your biblical and theological questions to our special guest. So who is our special guest this evening? Uh, he is the president of Reformation Bible College. He serves as the chief academic officer for Ligonier Ministries and is also a Ligonier Ministries teaching fellow. He's also the host of a number of podcasts. Who am I speaking about? Dr. Stephen Nichols. Dr. Nichols, thank you for joining us. Uh, I mentioned that you're the host of a number of podcasts. One of them is uh, the podcast Open Book, and right. season two has just dropped. Uh, the featured guest on that season was John MacArthur. What was it like to spend time with Dr. MacArthur and talk to him about sure. books and the impact they've had on his life and ministry? Oh, it was great, of course. You know, and I really enjoyed it. And it was interesting to me, because as we started to get into it, I thought, I, I see what he's trying to do here. He was linking together the, the influences on him as he was starting the ministry there at Grace 50 years ago. And he started off talking about his ecclesiology and then he went to his doctrine of God and he just kept moving. And I think it was about the fourth or fifth episode, it sort of dawned on me what was happening here. Uh, he had put a lot of thought into what were clearly influential books on him so this was just, it was a real joy for me. And as I was participating in it, I sort of saw it unfold. And I just hope it's helpful for people. I, ho I hope it's helpful for pastors as they think about their ministry, but also for people who sit in the pew and think about what it means to be in the church, what the church means for us, how intentional we have to be about preaching, about church practice, about our theology. Uh, I think all that comes through. Plus, I mean, we just know MacArthur. He's just a solid guy, and we're just so grateful for him, for the faithful ministry that he's had, the friendship that he had for RC. Uh, that comes through, and, and you hear him making reference to RC. So it's just, it was an enjoyable time. I hope people enjoy it. I, I hope they get to know him a little bit better, and also help, uh, hope they think a little better having listening to some of these uh, some of these episodes. Well, I know I've enjoyed listening to it, and if you haven't already, I do encourage you to subscribe. Uh, just search for Open Book wherever you listen to podcasts, or go to openbookpodcast.com. Now, if you have a question for Dr. Nichols this evening, you can submit those questions uh, using the hashtag AskLigonier on Twitter. You can send us a message on Facebook, or basically leave us a comment wherever you're watching the live stream this evening. Now, Dr. Nichols, would you be game uh, to begin this marathon this evening with a sprint yes. and do a little bit of a lightning round? Let's go. Okay, so lightning round means <clears throat> we're trying to aim for less than 90 seconds for an answer. Yep. All right, well, we've got an easy one here for you to begin the lightning round. <laughs> Susan on Twitter wants to know, in 90 seconds or less, what is the majesty of God? So, see, I, I usually trust you, Nathan, but you say an easy one, and it's the majesty of God, but let's, here we go. The psalmist says God dwells in light inaccessible. We can use any word. I remember talking to R.C. about this and he said, you know, the word I used was holiness, but there's a lot of words we can use. Glory, transcendence, majesty. What we're talking about here is the godness of God. It's an awkward expression. This is the most perfect being, God. And there's a sense in which he's revealed himself and we know who He is. We know who He is in the full complex of His attributes and in His works and in His decrees. But there's a sense in which God is a mystery. And the Bible uses a host of ways to get at it. Sometimes we even say God is awesome. In the old days, they would say God is terrible, right? Uh, it's not how we use that word today. Uh, but to say the majesty of God is one of the ways we expressed the Godness of who God is. I think you did good for less than 90 seconds. We're, let's go. All right. Next one. Next question from Facebook. Uh, what are your favorite classic works throughout church history? Oh, this is, so one thing you could do is, let's have one for every century. I think it's a great thing. Okay. We overlook some centuries, but I only have 90 seconds, so we'll skip a few centuries. So we go to the early church. I love the martyrdom of Polycarp. It's a second century text. It gives us fresh insight into what was happening in the church at that time. It helps us think about what it means to be a Christian in a culture that is hostile to Christianity. Martyrdom of Polycarp, first stop. Then we'll skip a bit to the 400s. No, we'll stop and we'll, yeah, we'll go to the 400s. We'll pick up Augustine's Confessions and Leo's Tome. 
But Leo's tome, you know, tome is a big book, it's actually only a seven page letter, so we'll throw that in. Aquinas, so the Summa Theologica, I've got a beautiful copy of Latin on one side, on the English on the other, but you can, you can find all kinds of versions. We come to the Reformation. I'm a big fan of the three treatises, Luther's three treatises. Uh, you have to have Calvin's Institutes. It's that mature thought of the Reformation. It's been going for a couple decades. Calvin gives it to us. We can skip on to Edwards, and I always tell people, you know, religious fractions, freedom of the will, original sin, you're going to think the deep end. Start with the sermons. And I'll tell you, one of my favorite Edwards sermons is a sermon called The Most High, A Prayer Hearing God. And it is a beautiful sermon on the doctrine of God in prayer. Uh, and then let's go to Charles Hodge, A Good Systematic Theology, and let's go right up to Holiness of God. We skipped a few centuries, but that's enough to get started. That's good. I have to look on Amazon to try and find some of those copies, I'm sure. Go ahead. Um, next question for you. Scott on Facebook, who was Martin Busser? Oh, so uh, Bootser was uh, one Thank of Thank you the... for the correct pronunciation. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, Bootser was one of the reformers. The, one of the things I loved about Bootser was he ends up going to Cambridge. He's such a star on the continent. He gets invited over to Cambridge, and this is the time of young Edward VI, who's the godly young king, and he's in between Henry and Queen Mary. And uh, it, under that, uh, under him rather in his reign, the Reformation just flourished. So Bootser is invited over to, to Cambridge. The other thing that's interesting about Bootser is his wife had married four times, he was the, she was widowed three times, he was the fourth husband to Webrandus. So sometimes she's called the wife of the, Ref, the bride of the Reformation. But Bootser was just a brilliant scholar, but what happened to him is once he got to Cambridge, uh, the, the water, something, didn't, just, didn't agree with him at all, and he picked up parasites, killed him after he was there a few years. So he didn't live as long as some of the reformers, didn't leave as, uh, behind as much of a corpus as the reformers, but a very significant reformer who was both on the continent and at Cambridge. And just to add quickly, I think we have a few more seconds, it was his preaching at Cambridge that probably was the most impactful. And if you ever get to go to Cambridge, you know, there's always the King's College Chapel, right? It's towering, it's where they do the Christmas Eve service, everybody knows it. The church you need to go to is the Church of St. Edward the Confessor. It's so small, it's tucked away, it's not even surrounded by a street, it's little walkways to get to it. That was the center of the Reformation. Thomas Bilney preached there, Ridley preached there, and Bootser preached there. And it was, the, it was his preaching that had a huge effect on these Cambridge students who then went out and took the Reformation with them. Well, Ben from YouTube says, how much credence should we put in early church writings like the Dadake? Yeah, so the early church is interesting. Just because of its proximity to the New Testament does not mean it's always right. And I think there's an assumption there that the, the closer you get to the source, the more pure. Well, that's not necessarily the case. There's a, there's a lot of danger zones as we get into the early church. Now, having said that, we've got to be very grateful for the, the three main areas where the early church helps us. Canon development, the Christological controversies, which then spill over into the Trinitarian heresies, and giving us a solid understanding of how scriptures came together and how we are to understand the scriptures as the Word of God, a solid Christology coming to us ultimately in the Nicene and Chalcedonian Creed, and then a solid Trinitarian understanding, and that comes to us in its fullest flower and blossom in Augustine. So those are areas where we can be very much helped by the early church. But on some other areas, for instance, one of the most prominent views of the atonement in the early church was the ransom theory. And there's nothing necessarily wrong with the ransom theory. The, the question is, you know, who is God paying the ransom to? And very quickly it emerged that God's paying the ransom to Satan, and that's just bad theology. Um, we, we see centuries later the preferred view of the atonement is the substitutionary view of the atonement. So to say, well, you know, the early church was ransom theory, ransom theory, ransom theory. Substitutionary atonement is sort of Johnny come lately. That is a misappropriation of the early church. So, a lot of promise in the early church, 
but some pitfalls. And it's like anything in church history. Ultimately, we have to hold it up to the standard of God's Word to judge it. Uh, Aaron from Twitter wants to know, does God really love the sinner but hate the mm. sin? You know, you hear this all the time, don't you? And it comes under the category of, we like to try to help out God. There are elements to the revelation of God that are difficult for us to take. And one of them is anytime we associate the word hate with God. It's hard for us to do that. But here's what we have. We have it in Scripture. So this idea that God hates the sin, loves the sinner, is contrary to two Psalms and also contrary to the opening verses of the book of Malachi. Esau have I hated, Jacob have I loved. We have to be very careful that we don't think somehow we help God by improving His PR for folks. So we have to be governed here by the text. Now, I don't think that means we run around saying God hates these particular sinners. God hates this particular group God, and hold banners up and, and parade up and down the street saying God hates, fill in the social group that, that's not like. I don't think that's the call for us, but neither do I think there's merit in that phrase. What we do need to talk about is that I was a worse sinner than anyone that we want to say God hates. We all were. And to understand, you know, R.C. said this, and I'm past, and it's lightning round, I'm past the 90 okay. seconds. R.C. said this how many times, right? It's one sin. Just the smallest sin is an affront to the holiness of God and just brings down the, the, the thundering wrath of God upon us. And when we slip into these kind of statements, we think we're doing God a favor, but we're not doing sinners any favor because we're not helping them see the wrath of God. We're not helping them see what that means. And until they see that, they don't see their true need for a substitute and they don't fully understand what Christ was doing on the cross. So sometimes we have to be careful in how we want to help God's PR. Uh, another question from Twitter for you. Can you be reformed and not agree with pedo-baptism? Oh, yes, of course. Uh, I knew we were going to get into baptism eventually here. Um, so we're talking about reformed. What are you talking about? Well, the Reformation and what comes out of the Reformation. And so you've got the solas and also in addition to the solas and what sort of holds the solas together is the view of the sovereignty of God. And this is true of whether or not you're reading Luther or Calvin. You're going to see it all the way through the Reformers. And you see it in Luther and his bondage of the will. In fact, Luther says in bondage of the will, so we're talking about the sovereignty of God, doctrine of election, all those tall grass doctrines people don't like to get into, right? What does Luther say? This is the centerpiece of the Reformation, right? This is Mr. Justification by Faith saying, no, no, the centerpiece is election and God's sovereignty and God's decrees. So to be reformed is to have a classical understanding of who God is. This comes to us from the creeds to have a, a, an orthodox classical understanding of Christology, again from the creeds. We've got the solas from the reformers, an unmitigated commitment to the sovereignty of God and the decrees of God. I think it affects a certain hermeneutic. I think eventually you're going to end up being covenantal if you're reformed and have a covenantal view of Scripture and a covenantal hermeneutic. But do you carry that covenantal hermeneutic all the way through to baptism? like the Presbyterians do, or the Congregationalists of old did? Or do you stop short and you have a believer's baptism view? Um, I think it's, perf first of all, it was perfectly within the bounds of the Reformation, and uh, I think it's within the bounds of being reformed. So I'm of a mind to be inclusive on the baptism issue uh, when it comes to being reformed. All right, we have another question from Facebook for you. Uh, did Kelvin use a Septuagint? 
So this is interesting. They all knew Greek very well, the, the reformers. They all knew Greek very well. Not all of them knew Hebrew as well. Calvin knew Hebrew. The other thing that's interesting is that, that we miss sometimes is Calvin spent time at Strasbourg. And Strasbourg was the home of probably the best exegesis that was happening during the time of, Reformation, of the Reformation. And it was there, in fact, this is where we get the, the, the Hebrew work that underlies Luther's work in terms of the scholarship and the, gram the Hebrew grammars. They're coming out of Strasbourg that's underlying for Luther's work. And this is also true of the, of the city of Basel, and Calvin spent time there. So, Calvin knew his Hebrew, he knew his Greek. You see him using his Hebrew in his Old Testament commentaries. But as a general rule, the Reformers knew their Greek better than they did their Hebrew. All right, I think we call that the end of the lightning round. You survived, you made okay. it. Um, I do want to let folks know that are watching live online that although tonight is a special event, answering biblical and theological questions isn't anything new for Ligonier Ministries. For almost 50 years we've been doing this, whether it was what R.C. Sproul used to call in the 70s gab fests or later Q&A sessions at conferences or more formal Ask R.C. events. Uh, we even had Dr. Sproul on Twitter answering theological questions on several occasions. Or most recently, our newest outreach, the Ask Ligonier chat service, which I want to tell you about now. 24 hours a day, six days a week. You can ask your biblical and theological questions inside the Ligonier app by messaging us on social media, by pressing the chat bubble uh, on the bottom right-hand corner of Ligonier.org. And we have a well-trained team of agents around the world are ready to answer your theological questions and point you to helpful resources. So whether you're preparing for Sunday school or a midweek Bible study, or perhaps just trying to dig into Scripture, maybe you're talking to an unbelieving friend and they ask you a question that you don't know how to answer, you can always ask Ligonier. So to learn more about that, please visit ask.ligonier.org. All right, well, we can give you a little bit more than 90 seconds to answer some okay. of these questions. So we can take a deep breath and we'll uh, turn to this question from Matthew on Facebook. He wants to know, what do you think about the emphasis on emotional sentiment, uh, sen sorry, what do you think about the emphasis on emotional sensationalism in the modern church? Hmm. So first of all, God made us whole people. We're not just brains. We're not just rational. So, so we've got to resist the urge anytime we hear the emotional or the sensational to just reject it. We've got to realize that, that God made us as persons with valid emotions. And we see valid emotional expression in the pages of Scripture. We see depression and sadness and how the psalmist or, or the prophet will take that to God. We see joy and, and sort of elation in the text and how that comes into worship. So, so let's not just have a knee-jerk reaction and say emotion is bad. But especially in the American church, we seem to be very, very susceptible to this. There's a difference between emotion and emotionalism. And when you get into emotionalism, now all of a sudden, the barometer for what's true or what's real is how I feel about it. And if I feel excited about this, this is good. If I don't feel excited about this, this is bad. And we can even judge doctrine that way. And we can begin to ask, how does this make me feel? Or how does a, a book make me feel, a biblical book? and we can judge its value to my life and, and my Christian walk. Uh, sometimes in emotionalism, we can say, well, you know, I don't want to be a hypocrite. Uh, I don't really feel like praying today. The last thing I want to do is be a hypocrite, so I'm not going to pray. Well, just start praying, right? It's our duty. It's our obligation. <laughs> so just start praying and see what comes of that. So I think sometimes, again, emotions, being emotional, there's examples of it in Scripture. It's, who God ma it's how God made us. But it can get carried away with itself, and we have to be very careful, very susceptible. The other thing I think is, we've got to be very careful. You know, when Edwards preached, sinners in the hands of an angry God, uh, Eliezer Wheelock, and you knew I was going to bring up Edwards uh, a lot tonight. Mm -hmm. Eliezer Wheelock, who's a minister, he went on to found 
Dartmouth College, right? He was in the audience that night. The sermon was preached in Enfield, Connecticut. And he was taking notes and observing. And at certain points in the sermon, I mean, Edwards, this sermon is full of imagery. The, the bow of God's wrath is bent and the arrow is aimed directly at you. This is intense. It wasn't seeker friendly. No. Oh, yeah, that too. I mean, mm -hmm. it's all sin and you're precarious and nature. And so what happens? Well, this had an impact. At Wheelock says people were shrieking, like shrieking in the audience. Here's what Edwards does. He stopped. He stopped. He stopped talking. He let people calm down, hmm. sort of get a hold of themselves. Then he proceeded with the sermon. Same thing. Builds up. He stops talking. So this is the opposite of what happens today. You see it on television. They play it up. And, and they know how to do it. And once they get them going, there is no way they stop. Play to that train. chorus one more time. Oh, man. And they ramp it up. See, so what was Edward saying? You know, listen, it, it's the idea here that you've got to reckon with. And I don't know how to judge your emotional response. You know, I was at a hockey game the other night. Joy, not so much, <laughs> right? Is, it, is that my judge of truth, right? Just because I'm happy about something or I'm crying about something and shrieking out. Like, what's going on in my heart? So I think we can learn a lesson from Edwards. And it's very crucial, uh, those who teach the truth and those who are teachers, you can, you can manipulate the emotions. Be warned against that. And for some reason, American evangelicalism has always been susceptible to it and uh, it gets played up. And uh, it's not a responsible handling of God's Word or caring for the flock. So I would add that. And, and it's a comfort for the Christian too, knowing that God's mm. Word is true, whether you feel good about it or not, His promises are faithful. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, Luther has a hymn, and it, it, I'm just coming from memory, it goes something like this, for feelings come and feelings go and feelings are deceiving. And if anyone knew about feelings, it was Luther. He's the whole range. Uh, and he says this, my warrant is the Word of God, not else is worth believing. So, this is a good point. Well, John on Twitter asks, what was Zwingli's impact on the oh, Reformation? I love that somebody brings up Zwingli. Sometimes a forgotten reformer. And he's at Zurich, and you've got to love, if you've seen any spy movies, Zurich's always in the storyline, so you got to love this. So here he is at Zurich. Um, nice thing about Zwingli is career as a reformer spans about 10 years. He's um, being worked on. He's at Basel when Erasmus is putting together the Greek text as a student, and he's likely helping in the production of the Greek New, Te New Testament in 1516. He takes a copy with him in his, to his first parish priest job, and it was... It was like a shrine, and so it was full of people coming to see the shrine, and a merry apparition or something like that. And so he'd go down and do Mass at 10 o'clock, then he had the rest of the day free. He says, this is all he had to do. And so he's up in his study, and he's, get this, 15, 17, 15, 18, 19, he's hand copying the Greek text. He has a printed Greek text, and he's hand copying to make his own text. Talk about being immersed in the Word. Then he gets the post at, at Zurich, goes to Zurich, New Year's Day, 1520. He decides he's going to do something novel. He's going to start at Matthew 1-1 and preach the text and preach through the Bible. And he does, preaches through the New Testament. And within two years, there's a sausage supper at Zurich. And it's a bunch of middle-aged men sitting around eating sausage. And Zwingli is there, and uh, other priests are there, Conrad Grebel, who goes on to be one of the Anabaptists, and Christopher Froschauer, who's the printer. And the printer's like, they're the guy in the town. They're the well-respected guy. So they're all there. Uh, Zwingli uh, does not partake. He, he cuts up the sausage, and he serves it, but he doesn't eat it, which I sometimes jokingly say, I shouldn't say. Anyway, this is what Zwingli does. So, uh, he, Twitter, ask me on Twitter later and maybe I'll answer. Um, but what's the significance? 
it's Friday and it's Lent. And the next Sunday, Zwingli gets up in the pulpit and he preaches a sermon entitled, On the Choice and Freedom of Foods. First of all, it's a great sermon title. But Zwingli says, look, Lent's not in the text. And this, this Roman Catholic Church has built all of these structures around us and all that is doing is obscuring the gospel. And it's basically like scaffolding, you know, you go, you go to see some, some great site in Europe and they're cleaning it. So they've got scaffolding. You didn't go to see the scaffolding, you went to see St. Peter's Dome in London. You didn't go to see scaffolding. And this is what Zwingli does. He just starts ripping down the scaffolding, shows people the gospel, and the Reformation comes to Zurich. The whole city votes on it, they become reformed. Uh, Ten years later, 1530, Zwingli's on the battlefield, and he dies. And that's the end of Zwingli, dies on the battlefield. There's a great statue of him at Zurich next to his church, and he's got the Bible in one hand and a big sword in the other, and, you know, there's something to that. So, yeah, Zwingli, colorful figure, fascinating figure. Um, if anybody looks into him, th they'd be glad they did. All right, a question here from Ryan on Facebook. He wants to know, why did you write a book on the blues? Oh, I did. So primarily, you know, the short answer is so I could build up my CD collection and call it research. But the real answer is this, Nathan. I was listening to um, a program on, on NPR years and years ago. My wife and I would listen to this called American Roots, R-O-U-T-E-S, American Roots. And it was just early American folk music. It was fun. It was an enjoyable program. And they kept referencing this ethnomusicologist named Alan Lomax. And I got his book, The Land Where the Blues Began, about the Mississippi Delta and those between the war years, World War I and World War II. These are all sharecroppers, right? Cotton farms. This is before the harvester, McCormick's harvester. This is all picked by it. And, you know, they're, they're, it's, some have likened it to slavery, that that era. And I'm reading this book and I'm thinking, there is a theological story here. There really is. And there's a story that I think some of us in that happy, clappy American evangelicalism just don't always get. And I'll tell you this, as I was reading that book, I was reading through my Bible that year, and I got as far as Ruth at least that year, so I was doing pretty well. Got out of Leviticus, made it to Ruth. And I'm reading Naomi, and she comes back, you know, and they say, was that, is that you, Naomi? And she says, don't call me Naomi, which means sweet, call me Mara, which means bitter. I went away empty, I'm sorry, I went away full, and the Lord has brought me back empty. And I mean, as clear, like a lightning bolt struck me. I thought, that's a blues lyric. I was full. I went away full, and the Lord brought me back empty. Like, that's a blues lyric. And I started to think about these, this, the, th that element of the biblical narrative that we miss sometimes. I love Easter Sunday. We all love Easter Sunday. Good Friday is part of the story. And sometimes we just want to get past Good Friday and get to Resurrection Sunday, and we must. But Good Friday is there. And so I wrote that book because this impacted my thinking theologically. I was seeing things I hadn't seen before and thought of things I hadn't thought of before. And I thought, there's an element of American evangelicalism that we need to hear this. Why don't we like the lament? And there's a lot of them in the Psalms. Um, there's an element here we need to, to embrace. So that's why I wrote the book. And if you've never contacted Ligonier Ministries before, I want to let you know about a special offer. If you visit ask.ligonier.org slash offer, that's ask.ligonier.org slash offer, you can go and request your free copy of R.C. Sproul's new booklet, God is Holy. We've designed this booklet as a helpful tool for you to be able to share with people and introduce them to the incredible theme of God's holiness, this important subject that Dr. Sproul was so well known for teaching. Uh, the place to visit is ask.ligonier.org org slash offer. And this is a limited time offer for those who have not contacted Ligonier Ministries before. So I encourage you to respond today. Well, speaking of uh, R.C. Sproul, 
a question that we get a lot mm -hmm. is, will there be an official biography um, of Dr. Sproul? And for some reason, <clears throat> I think you could be a good person to answer that question. The answer is God willing. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, I'm under contract. Uh, it'll be published by Crossway. And the goal is to have this out in 2021. Mm -hmm. And the significance of that date is it's the 50th anniversary of Ligonier Ministries. Uh, some of the greatest times, Nathan, I had just before R.C.'s passing were these biography sessions. And I, I would just go to his home, I'd sit with him. Uh, we did some of the open book recordings in his library. That was a great way to find out about his influences. But I would just sit with him and we'd mic up and we'd talk for an hour and we started. We literally started with the day he came home from the hospital. Actually, we started before that uh, because he loved to talk about the Sproul family history. Uh, so we, actually, we started with John Knox. <laughs> so the first, the first uh, minister that Knox ordains in Scotland is a minister named Sproul. Wow. So R.C. loved that, of course. So that's where we started, actually. We started with John Knox, and then we just would go through his life. And they were fascinating times. Um, I miss those times. I mean, I just, I truly do. I love going back, listening to the tapes. He was fun. The best parts of those sessions were when he would say, uh, don't put this in the book. And then he would tell me something. So. Do you respect those wishes? Uh, we'll see. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, it's in the works, but it uh, won't be out till 2021. Is there anything that surprised you as you sat down and had those conversations or mm. have done research yeah. um, into Dr. Sproul's life and ministry? You know, one of the interesting things, I knew this. I knew how influential college was on him. Uh, and I knew how influential uh, professors he had at college on him. Um, Thomas Gregory was a massive influence on him, his college years. Gershner, of course, everyone knows and aware of the John Gershner collection, or connection to R.C. and the impact he had. But an interesting thing that sort of missed about R.C., he wanted to be a pastor. And, and the whole time he was in seminary, he, he just wanted to be a pastor. That's all he wanted to do. And you know what happened was Gershner blocked him. Gershner saw that R.C. Should, should ha has academic potential and should go pursue a Ph.D. And uh, Gershner wanted him to do that. And so R.C. would interview with different Presbyterians. You know, Pittsburgh was, a, was the haven of Presbyterianism and the epicenter of Presbyterianism. There are Presbyterian churches all over, up and down Western Pennsylvania. And R.C. would go and visit with session after session to interview for churches his, his uh, junior and senior years of seminary only to find out that Gershner had called ahead <laughs> and said, no, you're not going to do anything with this guy. So, so that was interesting. Can I tell you a story? Yeah. If we have time for mm -hmm. a story, do you want to hear a story? I'd love to hear a story. Okay, so when he was a senior in seminary, he actually had a church. It was a small Presbyterian church in a little bedroom community of Butler, and Butler's just a little bit north of, of Pittsburgh. And the only thing in this town was a steel mill and of course, Pitzer, the Steelers, this is famous as what it was. And there in Butler was a steel mill that made uh, wheels for trains. So this is hard shell people, right? And these were uh, European immigrants. And in this neighborhood, they were all Hungarians. So R.C.'s called to their church. A uh, little parsonage. Uh, he's married, of course, has Sherry at this time. Little parsonage. And... Um, there they are, and R.C.'s preaching. He's also mowing the lawn, by the way. Uh, so he's the, he's the one who has to mow the lawn. But he gets a call one night, and uh, one of the parishioners, and she's very upset. And R.C. thinks, she sounds drunk to me. So she's very upset, she's very drunk, and she's mad because her daughter is with a no good young man. And she's telling R.C., you better get over here, because I don't know what I'm gonna do when he drops her off. I don't know what I'm gonna do to him. So this is like midnight. R.C. goes to the house, shows up at the house. She opens the door. It's one of these, you know, row homes. Goes up on the porch. She comes to the door, a bottle in one hand and a gun in the other hand. And R.C. is a student pastor as a, you know, 22-year-old or 24-year-old uh, in seminary. And all he can think to say is, I forget her name. He says her name. And he says, 
please, or he said, you don't want to shoot me. <laughs> please put down that gun. <laughs> and so she puts down the gun. So anyway, R.C. would go back to, to seminary and he would tell his advisors these stories. They didn't believe him. Like, this just doesn't happen to a student pastor, right? This happens over 50 years of ministry, the kinds of stories you have. But it, it, showed, it showed me something about R.C. Uh, he just wanted to teach people the Word of God. He never set out to do this, never set out to do Ligonier. I, I think he always was going to write books. Uh, he just has that, that way. I read some of his senior papers when he was a college student. They're brilliant. And he's, this guy's going to be a writer. I think it was his eighth grade teacher who said to him, don't ever let anyone tell you you don't know how to write. Hmm. Right. So, so I think he's always going to be a writer. But um, boy, you look in on those early years of R.C., he just wanted to pastor. He wanted to teach people God's Word. One of the things I love about R.C. is um, after he got married, I think it was Vesta's parents gave him a Thompson Chain Reference Bible because the Reformation Study Bible didn't exist back then. So, they, so that was the one Bible he wanted. They couldn't afford it. You know, he's a seminarian and he's they're living on, on scratch, right? And so I've, you've seen this Bible, I think. I've seen this Bible. It is so marked up. I mean, he poured his whole life into that Bible, and he let that Bible pour itself into him. And so these were the formative years of R.C. And, you know, we see him 40 years later, 50 years later, up there, and he doesn't have any notes, and he's preaching, and he's so crystal clear on the Word of God. You know, well, we got to go back and see him just pouring over Scripture and making that Scripture part of who he was. So I'm loving working on this biography because, you know, we know R.C., the public R.C., but it's fun to see what, what made him and what went into that uh, just gift to the church that was R.C. Sproul. I look forward to reading it. Uh, we've got a question here from Rick on Facebook. And he asked, how would you see the development of piety from Kelvin to the Puritans? Mm -hmm. How would you see this in contrast with trends today? Yeah. So, you know, sometimes the Puritans are sort of seen as overly zealous in their piety. You know, we, we have this understanding that they're always introspection is the word that's some, sometimes associated with the Puritans. We have these... Uh, really urban legends of the Puritans with four-hour sermons and why can't you sit there for 30 minutes or the Puritans would pray for hours on end and I can't even pray for five minutes in the morning. So the, what did J.I. Packer call them? The, the, the redwoods of the forest, right? So we have this image of the Puritans as almost super Christians. And so one of the things I think we've got to be aware of is how understanding how they understood piety. Because I think it can help us not see them as some un, un, example we're unable to follow, but actually see them as helpful to us. And so I'll come back to Edwards. Edwards is a very pious person, but he also recognized that he could worship God as he went on horseback rides through the Connecticut River Valley. And I, I gotta tell you, in the 1700s, the Connecticut River Valley it's probably, one, I mean, today it's one of the most beautiful places. In Edwards Day, the pristine nature of the Connecticut River Valley, it had to be beautiful. And so there was an earthliness to Edwards' piety, and there was an earthliness to the Puritans' piety, and we miss that sometimes. The other thing we want to say is, this isn't a development from Calvin. This is Calvin. So. Calvin's piety, and here too, we think of Calvin as this rational figure. You know, all you gotta do is read the Institutes. I mean, there are portions, there are portions in the Institutes that are just like so, uh, what we would, we would put in books today on the Christian life. One of my favorite portions in the Institutes is the, the sections on prayer towards the end in book four. Calvin has this beautiful discussion. He says it's like, you know, imagine you've got a treasure chest in your yard, and you never bother to, to dig it up. You just leave it there. You know it's there. You don't even bother to get a shovel, dig it up. He says, that's what prayer's like. And, you know, as you neglect prayer, it's like leaving this treasure unearthed right at your feet. Why'd you do that? All right, 
This is in the institutes of the Christian religion, right? Uh, so so let's, let's think through that, the reformers in piety and then the Puritans in piety. But what can we learn? I think we need to recognize that piety is ultimately godly living. It's all it is. It's, a, it's recognizing that the call to being a Christian is, to, is, the, is a holistic call. It's a holistic call to all walks of our life and to all areas of our life. And there's no area of our life that is outside the view of worshiping God. And it's either going to be done to advance our self-interests or to advance our own well-being, or it's going to be done to advance God and done in worship of Him. And the Puritans grasped that. It wasn't that, okay, I'm going to have all the, I'm going to spend four hours in prayer, and I'm going to spend four hours in Bible study, and I'm going to neglect life. It was, yeah, I'm going to pray and say my Bible. I'm going to dig into this Bible like anything. But in all of life, I'm going to worship God. And they had a capacious view of what serving God meant. And sometimes I think we just, we bifurcate these things. We, we, we say, well, here, this is spirituality, and it's the church stuff, and then there's my job, and then there's, you know, my family, and then there are my hobbies. And I don't know how they fit, so they don't. Right. The Puritans would not get that. And so I think they help us. So was the second part of the question so long ago? It was how do we bring um, that forward? Considering, yeah, the church in, uh, today. Yeah. yeah, so let's go back to it. Let's have that capacious view. Let's recognize what, it, what worshiping God and serving God in all of life really means. Not just Sunday, Monday to Saturday. That's right. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, before we go to another lightning round, if you're game, sure. I've got another question for you. On Twitter, we're asking, uh, can you tell us a little bit, and this is, of course, with your time with recording things for Open Book, can you tell us about the libraries of Dr. Sproul, MacArthur, and Mola? <laughs> so, I just spent uh, a couple days cataloging R.C.'s library. Oh, treasures. And it's funny what he was into, too. Uh, Burke's commentary on the laws of England, he had two whole sets of that. Uh, so, and they're like red, they're well thumbed. Um, lots of Dutch books. He, you know, Bavink has come out in the four volumes in the English translation. He's got that. He's also got the original Bavink in the Dutch and notes all through it. He's got all Burkhauer's in the Dutch. He's got Latin books with notes in Latin. This was all forced upon him in his uh, doctoral program uh, by Burkhauer at the Free University in Amsterdam. Uh, commentaries, and you can go back and see which books, you know, we know which books he was preaching through recently at, uh, at St. Andrews before his passing. You can go back and look at the commentaries he was reading in the dog ears, and he was a very active reader. I asked him in one of those open book, because there'd be times where there'd be underlining, and then there would be times where there'd be underlining and highlighting, and then there'd be times where there's underlining, highlighting, and big asterisks written it's like in the, the scroll margin. code. Oh, totally. So, like, what does that mean? He goes, well, the underline are important. The underlined and highlighted are really important, and the underlined, highlighted, and asterisk are super important. Right. So this is RC. Uh, it's always passionate about everything. He was a passionate reader, and it, it comes through. Uh, so I love his book. And then you're digging around, and oh, there's the Hardy Boys. And so he goes back and buys. This is a new copy. So he just remembers reading Hardy Boys as a kid, and he reads one. Uh, right. So. You just, you gotta love the library of R.C. MacArthur, uh, we did that in his, in his church library. Uh, so we didn't get to his home library for that. But he's got four libraries. Um, of course, we got a few others. Is it all right to say a few others that I've recorded that we're waiting to? I think so. Okay, yeah. so so we'll do a, a spoiler alert mm -hmm. here. Um, Al Mohler's coming. He has an epic library. I mean epic. He has an intern who just catalogs books for him. Uh, and then we also did... Is that a full-time role? Possibly. Oh, yeah. I'm sure it is. Uh, and he, he numbers all his books, you know. You have to wait for the episodes to find out okay. what number he's up to. And then we did Derek Thomas for a few episodes, odd episodes. And he has a, a, a library. He has a library in one office. He has a library in another office. He has a library at home. But then he has a separate room that is set up with like stacks, like a library. And it's this basic size office room full of stacks. Those are his books. 
So one of the things you begin to see, and this is what's interesting, because when I do these open books, uh, when I do these episodes rather for open book, this is what I realize. These books really impacted these people. Um, these, these are people who care about ideas, and these books really impact people. So you don't, you don't have to have a huge library, but you have to have a good one. And not only do you have to have a good one, you got to read them. Mm. And it's amazing. Even a library of a hundred good books, think about what that can do for you. Think about that, the framework that can give you. And that's what I come away with every time I talk to these guys. I mean, they read a book, they want to know their view of baptism. This was Derek Thomas. He, he wanted to know his view of baptism. He came out of a more of a believer's baptism. It was a book that he read that led him to Scripture, that led him to his view of baptism. It was John Stott's basic Christianity that led him to Christ. Books were hugely influential on him, hugely influential on Al Mohler. I've never been with Al where he hasn't gone to a used bookstore and come back with an armload of books. And books were hugely influential on R.C. Um, it's because, you know, books really do shape us. And that's why it's important what we read, that we read good books. Um, so that's what I come away with with these, uh, with these recordings. Well, if you're just tuned in, we are referencing Dr. Nichols' podcast, Open Book. You, you can subscribe to that uh, by searching for Open Book with Stephen Nichols wherever you listen to podcasts or by visiting openbookpodcast.com. Are you ready for our second Let's lightning go. round of the evening? Okay, Caleb <clears throat> from YouTube. He asked, how can I love the truth but not become a Pharisee? Yeah, sure. So again, one of the things we go back to is uh, recognizing who we are as whole people. So we're not just rational people. It's about the truth. It's also about the, Edwards would call them the affections. Now this is not the emotions, but Edwards would say, listen, this is when you know it, when you sense the sweetness of it. Calvin says this. Calvin says this in, in the Institutes, uh, a saving faith, Calvin says, is the sensus suavitatus, a sense of sweetness. You see it in the psalmist. The psalmist desired the Word of God, has desired the honeycomb. Uh, listen, if this is the truth and the truth of God's Word, you're going to see its inestimable value and it's going to impact you. So Pharisees weren't interested in the truth. They didn't want the truth. They actually wanted to avoid the truth. So go ahead, stick with the truth, get as much truth as you can, because true truth, as Francis Schaeffer said, all that's going to do is drive you to worship. Well, Chris on Instagram, he says, if God doesn't elect on the basis of foreseen merits, is there anything at all about the elect that makes them electable? Yeah, no. <laughs> it's totally a mystery in God's love. So here's the beautiful thing. Uh, go to Deuteronomy. Go to chapter 6, chapter 7, and chapter 10, and look at God's election of Israel. And at one point, God says, I did not choose you because you were the greatest of all the nations. You were the least. All right? He's got Egypt. If I was God, I would choose Egypt because you've got a superpower. You've already got a leg up to conquer the world with your religion, right? Israel is a tiny sliver of land between massive nation states. And then at one point in Deuteronomy 10, God says, to the Lord God belongs the earth and the nations and the heavens, and yet I set my elective love on you. If there is any text we need that tells us that God's election is absolutely unconditional, it's that one. There is nothing in us that merits us, that merits God's election. It is purely His good pleasure and will and grace and love. And this is Ephesians 1, and what does this do but just drive us to gratitude and worship? It is according to the riches of His grace, period, full stop, don't mess with that doctrine. All right, another question from Twitter for you. What books written by the Puritans are must-reads? Jeremiah Burroughs, The Rare Jewel of Contentment. If there is something we need in the 21st century, it's contentment. We are bored and we have more stuff than we've ever had. Uh, we complain and we have more stuff than kings 
have had in previous centuries. I do this, I complain. We need to learn the rare jewel of Christian contentment. So I'd say go with Burroughs. While you're at Burroughs, go ahead and stick with Gospel, gospel Worship. It's a great book. Uh, R.C. was a big fan of Burroughs, so he would have recommended Burroughs. I think Thomas Watson, A Body of Divinity, just walks through uh, the, the Westminster Standards. And uh, it's, it's such helpful doctrine that is so practical in the writing of it. So Thomas Watson, A Body of Divinity, is a, is a great text uh, to go to. I think a third Puritan, if you want the tough-minded Puritan, but he well repays. But listen, you've got you've to be willing to reread a couple paragraphs, uh, is John Owen. Just mountaintop, Mount Everest of Puritan theologians. And anywhere, you can read anywhere in John Owen and you're going to benefit. I think you do better, though, actually, if you read later Owen um, and then you go to younger Owen. Uh, but yeah, there's a good place to start. Okay, that's a helpful list. Uh, we have Corey uh, on YouTube. He's saying, is there anything wrong with using the quote, sinner's prayer? Uh, so it's in one of my favorite Johnny Cash songs, uh, so I would have to say no. But I think this, uh, this is going to go. So <laughs> I love the Book of Common Prayer. The old one, not the new stuff, the old, old ones. And they have prayers for, for uh, storms at sea. And it's all flowery, blah, blah, blah. It's over a paragraph long. Then, that, then it has short storm for prayer at sea. And it's, Father, have mercy. Son, have mercy. Holy Spirit, have mercy. Amen. Uh, listen, that's it. Have mercy on me, a sinner. And that sermon prayed with a contrite heart. God will hear that prayer. So the, the thing is not trusting in the prayer, but no. actually just meaning what you're saying. Exactly. Mm -hmm. But it's fully, so listen, this is it. It's the have mercy on me. We're back to unconditional election. I, I don't deserve this at all. I, I deserve nothing from you. P have mercy on me. I mean, we see it in the text, don't we? The, 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 here's the publican over there saying, beating his breast, have mercy on me, a sinner. That's, that's the prayer. That shows we, we are beginning to understand. Mm -hmm. uh, James on Twitter is asking, what is the best biography of Martin Luther? Oh, Baton, here I stand. There was a whole bunch of them came out for, two, for 2017. I think I might have written a book on Luther, but um, Baton, here I stand. Nobody brings Luther to life like Baton. Uh, Nathan from YouTube wants to know, what were the books that shaped Martin Luther's theology? Oh, well, I mentioned that Luther had some influences from Basel and from Strasbourg. So some of the reformers from Basel and Strasbourg were, oh, we can back this up. This is easy. The first time if we got to put, put Luther at um, uh, Erfurt, and for the first time, he holds a complete Bible in his hand, and that's the book that influences Luther. Uh, we've got to realize how off the mark the thinking of the church was. And so it's, it's the Bible for Luther that impacts him. And imagine, you know, he's in his 1510s. I mean, this is, he's, he's 30 years old. To the first time he holds a whole Bible in his hands, right? And then it's only a matter of time. And that's what happened. Uh, we have another question here. If you could share a meal with anybody from church history, dead or alive, who would it be? Yeah. And why? Luther, totally, because he's just fun. I love Edwards. I would, l I, I love Calvin. I, I don't, I'm not sure about their personalities though. You know, especially Edwards, he would talk, he, when he was a young guy, he would talk about the discipline of eating. As, Luther, no, he's just gonna be fun. Um, so if you're, if you're asking share a meal, it's going to be Luther. Okay, final question for you for this lightning round. Uh, 90 seconds or less, who was Charles Finney? Charles Grandison Finney was the figure of the Second Great Awakening. He started off Presbyterian, but he was an odd Presbyterian because he did not like the Westminster Standards, and he ends up, you know, moving away from Presbyterianism. Rochester, New York, all of a sudden, booming population, 
Finney goes there, starts preaching, massive conversions, moves to New York City, massive conversions, ends his life president of Oberlin College in Ohio, was the figure of the Second Great Awakening. He also introduced what are called the new measures into American evangelicalism. Probably no figure casts his shadow over American evangelicalism more than Charles Grandison Finney. And, spoiler alert, not necessarily for the good, in fact, for the bad. He's the one who introduces a cooperative effort, both in the preaching and in the receiving, between man and God for God to work. In order for God to work, it has to be a cooperative effort. This is bad theology. This is bad church practice. And so Charles Grandison Finney uh, plays that role in American church history. You, you survived the second lightning round. So I want to remind you, if you haven't already, to visit ask.ligonier.org slash offer to request your free copy of R.C. Sproul's new booklet, God is Holy. As I said, this resource has been designed with evangelism and discipleship in mind, a very helpful tool to introduce people to the important theme of God's holiness and the teaching of Dr. Sproul. So this is for those who have not contacted Ligonier Ministries before, so make sure you visit ask.ligonier.org slash offer. Well, we have time for just a couple more questions this sure. evening. So next question is from Richard on Twitter, and he asks, why do Reformed Christians in America focus on the Westminster Confession, but in Europe the emphasis seems mm. to be on the historic three forms of unity? Yeah, sure. So, so basically, coming out of the Reformation, we have different branches. So they're all agreed on a couple of things. They're agreed they're against Catholicism. They're agreed on the solas of the Reformation. They're committed to the sovereignty of God. And because of the sola scriptura, they're committed to preaching the word. So, so they have all that in common. But there really are different branches of the Reformation. And so we've got the, the Lutherans, and that, of course, is initially was the Evangelische, the Gospel Church in Germany. And their standard is the Augsburg Confession and later the Book of Concord, which includes the Augsburg Confession and some sermons on it. And so that's the Book of Concord. That's the Lutheran Confession for the Lutheran Church. When you go to the Swiss lands, that's the, technically, the Reformed Church. And so the Reformed Church is the three forms of unity. And so uh, that, that's, that's largely the continent, right? You've got to go over to the, the United Kingdom for the Westminster Standards. And remember this too, this is a century after, century, 120 years after the Reformation gets started. So now we have this reform group, they were trained, uh, a lot of their roots go back to, to Knox, trained under Calvin in Geneva, goes back to Scotland. We have the Scots Confession, which I love because here's this church history text. All five guys who wrote this thing were named John. I just picture them sitting around the table saying, John, no, the other one, no, the other one. So anyway, the Johns, they write this is Scott's Confession. It just happened providentially. Um, but then you've got the Westminster Standards. And so the Westminster Standards then become the confessional, uh, um, the confession of faith for the Presbyterians, uh, for the various Puritan groups, for the, the Congregationalists who come, and they're called independents in Old England, they're called Congregationalists in New England. They make some tweaks to the Westminster Standards here. The Baptists follow the Westminster Standards. They, they have the London Confession of Faith, which is mostly the Westminster Standards. They change the, the church polity, and they change the church and state issue, and they change the baptism language. Um, so the, the Westminster Standards comes, comes to be the confessional standards for those Puritan groups in the United Kingdom. So, so what we see there in these various Reformation confessions is something we sometimes miss, and that is we didn't have a Reformation, we had Reformations, and we have substantive branches of the Reformation, and there were minor disagreements on issues of church polity or church practice or the application of the Sabbath, for instance, is a distinction that uh, some make, uh, they see, and it's a valid d distinction to see in the Heidelberg Catechism, for instance, versus the Westminster Standards. So those are some of the differences. But don't let the differences fool you of the massive substantive agreement that was there in the Reformation. 
Well, one final question for you, dealing with the authority of God's Word, so a great place to, sure. to end. Nikita on Facebook asks, I've encountered people who do not view Paul's letters as authoritative and God-breathed. What are some good arguments for Apostle Paul's, for the Apostle Paul's authority? First and second Corinthians. This is exactly what Paul was dealing with in his own day that his apostolic authority was challenged. We don't have to come to the 21st century. We can stick in the, in the uh, 40s and 50s. Um, what you find is Paul saying, you know, you're right. I'm not the guy, and this is not because of me, but this is because of my apostolic position, and this is because I speak for God. That's why you have to follow this. If you get into First and Second Corinthians, you're going to see what Paul appeals to. He doesn't appeal to his wisdom. He doesn't appeal to his cunning. He doesn't appeal to his literary artifice. He appeals to the fact that he is sent by God, and he is the mouthpiece for God, and he speaks God's authority. He is an apostle called by God. That's his authority. So it's very fascinating this question would come up because, again, you see it in Paul. He doesn't write on his own authority. He writes on God's authority. Well, thank you, Dr. Nichols, for your time this evening. This has been great, Nathan. Thank you. You're welcome. I just want to let you know, those that are watching live, that it doesn't end now. Uh, when you have biblical and theological questions, you can ask Ligonier 24 hours a day, six days a week. Uh, as I said earlier, we have a team of well-trained agents uh, positioned around the world in multiple time zones to be able to, to pull that effort off, ready to answer your questions uh, about theology and the Bible. And if we can't answer that question for you, they'll be uh, happy to point you to a resource that can. So please, I encourage you to learn all the ways that you can Ask Ligonier your biblical and theological questions. Visit ask.ligonier.org. Well, I'm Nathan W. Bingham, and I look forward to seeing you next time.